You are listening to the Running Channel podcast with me, Sarah Hartley, Rick Kelsey in the corner pressing buttons and special guest this week as Andy's on holiday is 229 marathoner, GB international athlete, coach, content creator and to use her own words, all round running addict, Philly Bowden. How are you? What an intro. I'm good. Thank you for having me. It, it it's might so exciting be easier, to be Sarah, if we just say what she doesn't do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she just start listening. Oh, there's a long that. list for that as well. It can get quite embarrassing, actually. <laughs> right, let's get into it. So, Philly, welcome. We always start off by talking about our week of running. Have you got any highs and lows from this week? Um, it's been, I would, I'd like to say it's been an uneventful week, but I was thinking about this on the train down here and I had a little bit of a niggle the week before. So I've kind of got back into a full week of running every day, still hopping on the bike for my doubles. Um, and I got absolutely battered on Wednesday. So I had a triple day to start off with, run, gym, and then bike. And awful. sandwiched in the middle of that, absolutely awful, was a physio session. Oh. And we kind of attacked all of the uh. causes for the week before of causing the niggle. So needles in the hamstring, needles in the glute, deep tissue in the back. I kind of walked out feeling a little bit lopsided, but I think uh, it's solved all my problems. Philly, when you said absolutely <laughs> battered, now your battered and my battered are probably quite two, two different things. <laughs> yeah. I thought you'd, you know, had a, had a, a night on the Gavin. <laughs> I thought you were going to say like a really hard session, but neither of those either. No, it just got no, taped up and held together. So, oh, on a triple day is so. Did it go run, physio, gym? No, it was run, gym, get the lift out of the way so I could actually use my muscles. Yeah, physio and then bike. Which by that point I was basically a zombie. Yeah, awful. Absolutely yeah. awful. Rick, did you do any triple days this week? No, 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 no not at all. No, at all. <laughs> triple Gabby? No, I, I did. wouldn't recommend. <laughs> no, no, that <laughs> sounds great. Um, I, I did parkrun on Saturday and the most, uh, the oddest thing happened at parkrun. There was an argument over the start time. Now, everybody knows what time parkrun starts in, in yeah and 9 30 in scotland and then so we we, we <laughs> i always got i always like to add it in was it on the, the border so it's 9 15 no, no well, that's, that's, a, that's a good point no there was she was about to start the the race director and then someone on the front line went um excuse me it's it's not nine o'clock there are people still coming she goes well my watch says it's nine o'clock and he, he went well i'll show you my watch it doesn't say it's nine o'clock so they argued for five minutes by which point it definitely was nine o'clock <laughs> and everyone got going Never seen it before in my life. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I love how that's an argument from someone on the start line. Surely you just want to... And if she's already there ready, right? She well, not finished her warm-up? Some, or... I've noticed some parkruns do, you know, let it ramble a little mm. bit, closer bit to 9, 10. Late. But, you know, our one, Your a, one a, is... a secret location is militant. I was going to say, I have never... I have done a lot of different parkruns. I've heard it start late. But I've never early. seen people angry that it's starting it's like early. It's like early, 8, 8.59 it was about to go. Really? And oh. honestly, <laughs> yeah. I tell you what, if you're turning up to park ground at 8.59, yeah. do better. In in, in a <laughs> secret more... location in North London. <laughs> yeah, just, just be a little bit more prepared. Be prepared. Be prepared. Or just take the L. Just be late. Yeah. yeah. Billy, do you yeah. ever do park run? Uh, rarely. I think I've probably done about four and... Because of that, I've been late to a quarter of them. Oh, right. so the you one mean, that we did in fancy well, if you come dress, to ours, we you wouldn't have got in. fully late to, so, yeah. But see, it's fine. You can start your watch, you're in fancy dress. It doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, just get a little bit of extra running in. I mean, you've got to then take the results with a pinch of salt and, and you can know yourself what what you ran. Yeah. Um, but, but then you've got nice. a great, like, oh, what did you run? You go through people as well because you're picking yeah. everyone up literally from the back. So it's quite a kind of feel good experience in that sense. Not for the people you're passing, obviously. That was nice. <laughs> Um, you get to see more people yeah but i suppose you don't socially get to run with your friends as much because you're always training at such a high level so yeah. actually being able to do a parkrun style run is that something that you'd like to do i'd like to do a few more because i love the parkrun community like i think it's something mm. really special and sometimes i feel like there's a bit of a barrier between that and the elite side of things unless you're turning up to a parkrun to do a time trial or See the, the world record went recently. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I'd like to use it a little bit more in training in that sense, but also, yeah, just to kind of do a chill run with a group of people. Mm. But yeah, I'm normally doing a session or doing a long run at that time on a Saturday morning. It's all a little bit serious <laughs> just and looking not as fun. At, <laughs> just looking at Park Run from afar, wishing you yeah. were with them. I sometimes drive past it on my way and I'm like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so I want to get into now, you are an absolutely phenomenal athlete. For anyone who hasn't watched Philly's YouTube, go and watch Copenhagen Marathon this year because it is absolutely, it's so good. Such a good video. Oh, but for you. anyone who doesn't know you, who are you? When did you start running? Where did this kind of amazing career begin? Oh, this is like the elevator pitch. Um, it's a weird one. I kind of started running very half-heartedly in primary school as a way to get out of class, basically, because they came in and said, there's a cross-country trial. You can either sit in this maths lesson or run around the football pitch a couple of times. And I was like, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> get me out of here. Um, and I suppose I could have kind of followed it from then, but I was doing a lot of other things as a kid. Mm. Loads of different after-school clubs, like just anything to keep me busy. And then... I suppose it's probably about five years later, secondary school, joined the after school club and the coach was like, you, you, you're all right, join the athletics club. And it all sort of started from there, very sort of traditional Tuesday, Thursday evenings down at the track, making making a fool of myself, doing sort of wheelbarrow races as a warm up with my friend. <laughs> nice. And did you always enjoy it from that level? Like what was the pinnacle moment where you were like, okay, I'm quite good at this and I enjoy this? Yeah, I loved it when I started it. I don't think I was sort of amazing. I was very sort of mid-pack average in my, in my sort of club and my group. And I suppose the enjoyment for me went up the better I got at it because I'm a very competitive person. So the kind of glimpse of even nearly winning, I was like, yes, I need to do more <laughs> of this. Um, so yeah, just going through the kind of age groups, not taking it too seriously, too young, I think mm. is a big factor as to why I'm still doing it now because I didn't sort of fall out of love with it from having too much pressure on me at such a young age. So when did you actually realize that you were really useful? Um, <laughs> I love that way <laughs> useful. Yeah, useful. I don't know. I think... I set some big goals for myself when I was sort of approaching university age groups because I'd made my first British champs, got mm. invited, and I wasn't expecting that. That was really cool. Felt very out of my depth. I think I raced Ailish McColgan in the steeplechase back when she did it. She probably lapped me, but I was just <laughs> really happy to be there. Um, and then when I got to uni, I saw how good other people were and kind of went for it from there. And I think maybe a year later, I got my first GB vest. So I maybe class that as useful by that point. <laughs> and at that point when you're in an environment where you're going from like okay I enjoy this like I'm not the best but I enjoy this and then you keep getting put in situations like with Irish McColgan where you're like okay there are a lot of people who are good at this mm. is there any moment where you go like oh no mm. I'm gonna step away or did that just make you hungrier to like keep filing away at it yeah I don't think there was ever a moment that it got overwhelming obviously you get very nervous for big races like that and I'd, I'd always have this really strange thought as a kid when I was still at school or at uni I'd stand on a start line with five minutes until the race would go and I'd be there like God, I'm so nervous I feel sick with nerves I'd rather do an exam right now and then when I'd <laughs> wow. be going into the exam hall I'd be like oh, I'm sick with nerves I'd rather do mm. a race right now and I don't think I ever really would rather do the other and once the gun goes off you're fine uh, you know those nerves sort of dissipate and mm -hmm. I think the feeling afterwards sort of outweighs the the sickness of the nerves beforehand. And where are you now with running? What are the like goals that you're currently working towards? So yeah, the next big one, I'd like to run the Olympic qualifying time in the marathon, which doesn't necessarily mean I'll go to the Olympics. Like definitely doesn't unless I really smash the time because mm. it's really difficult these days to qualify. Um, but that's a big marker and that would be about a minute and 25 seconds off the time I've run now. A minute and 25? No, two minutes and 25. Um, and yeah, I just want to keep doing the road races. I love the atmosphere that you get at the big marathons, big half marathons. Um, I really feed off that. So just knocking some times off and go kind of using it as an excuse to kind of see yeah. different places and race in different places. So from where you are now to getting that qualifying time, what have you got to do and how long is it going to take if you're in with a shot? I think it's a lot of what I'm already doing chipping away because it's kind of stacking the weeks the months the years on top of each other so it's not necessarily adding anything new in but looking at what I did last time around and seeing where we can kind of tweak things and do things slightly better um hopefully about six months because I think I'm going to be doing it in January so we'll say that's the right amount of time because that's when yeah. I'm going to do it I'm going <laughs> to go for it then um and sort of just push the line a little bit further up yeah. in the volume kind of every time, maybe by about 10% if you can, not making any kind of really big jumps. So you kind of just touched on it there. Even if you make the time, you might not get into the Olympics. So explain that. 
Yeah, so at the moment, the way that you qualify for major championships has had an overhaul. So it's it used to be you get the qualifying time and in the UK you come top two at the trials, you're guaranteed to go. And then there's a third discretionary spot. And World Athletics have brought in a new system whereby they want 50% of the competitors to make the championships through qualifying times, the old sort of traditional route, if yeah. you like, and then 50% of the competitors through uh, rankings, a world ranking system where you get points from doing different races. But um, our governing body, British Athletics or UKA, have said that they're not going to take anyone from the rankings. So it's kind of cut in half, if you like. It's only the old school qualifying times. And because it's a 50-50 route, those qualifying times are much harder because 50% of people have got to come from the rankings. So... Um, I think as well, a lot more people in the UK than two people or those mm. two spots will run that time. So you've kind of got to run it and then some to mm. be in with a shot of being selected. It's so tough. Does that make it harder as well? Because before, obviously there's a kind of competitive nature to everything that you do, you're like trying to race, mm. but does it make it harder because now you're even more up against other people who like should be your ally allies right like there are other British athletes who are out there doing the same thing you should be able to like support each other but now it's even more like well less of us can go now yeah and I don't find it too difficult in terms of comparison between mm. other Brits because like I'd love loads of people to smash the time because it just elevates the sport in this country and if it means I'm bottom of that pile so be it you know I'm in control of my own performances if they run quicker they run quicker and fair enough um, but it does make it difficult in the sense that kind of the goalposts are moving. Last year at the World Champs, the time was 2.29.30, literally a year ago. So I would have run that. This year it's 2.28. So it's like, ah, I'm late. <laughs> yeah. Damn it. Yeah. That's a big shift. Yeah. A minute and a half. That seems massive. Yeah. It's a big jump. In a year. <sighs> We're seeing the times tumbling down though as well. So I suppose they're kind of following that trend yeah. as well as the the ranking system, meaning that the times need to be tougher so that it is only 50% of the field that can can get the time. I mean, it'd take me three years to do that at Park Run. <laughs> 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 Knock a minute and a half off. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, yeah. How does that affect your training? Like, are there days where you're just like, everything is so stacked up? I suppose it affects my mentality a little bit when, you know, the news comes out that British athletics aren't going to take people through the rankings because it's a bit like, oh, it's, it doesn't seem fair mm. because that's the system, you know, other countries will take people from the invites and the rankings. But, you know, I kind of come back to why I love doing this and put that to one side because it doesn't change the fact that I love running and I still want to, you know, see how far I can get. And as much as the Olympics is always the holy grail of like this elite sport, there's still some really cool things you can do if that isn't the main focus for the next cycle or however long. And for people who have no idea what the elite world is like, what are there? We always, I feel like when people talk about elite sport, there's like, it's always sometimes like the negatives of like, you have to run so much. You have to do this. It's, it's bad. What are the highlights of from when you went from, being a runner that was working really hard to an elite athlete? Um, well, I think for me is that I don't have to do my day job that I didn't like doing before, working a <laughs> nine to five at a desk. What was it? I was a civil servant. Were you? Yeah. So I Literally, that was the last thing I was expecting to come I out of your house. What are you, you going to guess? Literally, do you say, I, I, just, I just said, come out your house. <laughs> <laughs> but that also works. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I was going to expect you to say, I, I don't know, a veterinary surgeon or something. I, 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 just oh, that's a cool I, I, I just wasn't expecting a civil servant. I mean, yeah. I can't imagine you in the planning department ticking off dormers. No, I was in the policy world oh, were as you? well, which looking back, I just, it was probably not the, the best kind of choice because it doesn't really match up with my personality. I, I kind of felt like an imposter the whole time I was there because I just didn't feel sort of... Really? I don't know, like it was quite stuffy sort of as a, an environment and you've got to kind of love it to do it. I Is that what you that studied? About. No, I did psychology actually. So, but I felt very lost after uni, not really knowing what I wanted yeah. to do or what I was meant to do. So I thought grad scheme will go public service and, and see if I can, you know enjoy that and I didn't so it's the best <laughs> part of it is that I don't have to do that yeah um and that you know I can say that running or running related work creating content coaching athletes yeah. sometimes running races is my job which is really cool and it gives me a lot of flexibility to to do that and kind of 
put running first mm. and then center my life kind of around it. So, you know, I could have a meeting with an athlete in Australia at 8 p.m., but it means that like I can get up and train and sleep till eight in the morning, which yeah. feels like a luxury. And so, you know. so you'd always do that, even if you weren't a pro runner, you think you'd always be involved in running. I think so now, like just loving what I do so much, it feels like I found what I'm meant to be doing. Mm. And, you know, I always, I, I, I think of like catastrophes that will never happen. Like if I, you know, lost a limb or something or couldn't run for whatever reason anymore. And I would definitely, I think I'd throw myself even more into working in the running space because I just love it. Yeah, you're a bit like Andy, except not lazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, if you had the option right now, deep into training, that we're in a basement right now, would you have got the lift one down or would you have taken the stairs? I'd probably go with convenience, you know. I probably would have got the lift. It is a rest day <laughs> oh, today God. for me oh, as well. Know. Maybe, so I'm kind of maybe we got this wrong. Every effort there. Oh, yeah. All elites are the same. One, one, four. One, one, <laughs> to be fair, it is two you, flights. Uh, two, oh, and you, I didn't actually know which the ground. floor it was on. <laughs> you, could, <laughs> you, you could probably have jumped it. it. You, literally. <laughs> okay, if I knew you it was one floor, down. I would, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sort of no, in no you space. voted lift now. No, you voted lift. <laughs> okay, and, I'm committed. Andy would get a lift down two steps. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just to avoid it. And he's running a marathon later on this year as well. Yeah. Mm. Andy would be horizontal all day if he could. If he possibly could, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's currently chasing after kids in France. <laughs> um, so, what does I want to know as well? Like, what does your kind of typical week look like training for a marathon? Ooh, it depends where I am. So, we tend to go to altitude in a marathon block. For, I like going in the last four weeks. So I suppose the only difference there is that I'm somewhere normally quite picturesque in the mountains, mm -hmm. um, enjoying whatever different food they have there. Um, but pretty much running every day, some days running twice a day. I do use a bit of cross training in the mix as well to kind of offload the legs. Um, but yeah, typical day, if I've got a workout, then I'll get up probably at sort of half seven, mix up my drinks, get those ready, feel probably a little bit nervous and sick. So it'll be the main sort of mm. session of the week. Um, that usually translates in me just being hyper. That's my nervous energy rather than like <laughs> one of these quiet, serious people. So I have to be careful if I'm if I'm with someone that's the other type of nervous because we'll just annoy each other because they'll be there kind of preparing for the session and I'm like running around like a giddy child. Um, Interesting. Is that hard as well? Because quite often when you when you're like in training camps or you'll go to competitions, you, you quite often like share rooms with people. Mm. So then do you have to really go like, are you hyper as well? Or I kind I of just off? feel off the vibe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I do try and sort of tone it down if I can tell that someone is the more sort of leave me alone type of pre-race person, which I feel like a lot of people are. Yeah. Um, and then I just I think that's the stereotype. <laughs> <laughs> I think I do think that's the stereotype of racing though, that you always imagine like, oh, they'll have their headphones on. You know, like when serious. you see people in like basketball games and they'll like have their headphones on or like come out and just, really be in the zone yeah I think I'd I'd be like you I'm a nightmare before a marathon yeah I I'm I think all of my disorganizedness just sort of comes out and is just very there's chaotic. a lot of there's a lot of admin before marathon races as well so I feel like yeah. that yeah. makes the morning of it even more stressful I have to be got... very organized so I do have my strategies of like writing bullet points out of where I need to be and when and then read that over so that I know and, you know, in normal life, I'll probably be sort of 10 minutes late. But on marathon day, I can be just about okay. on time. Are you superstitious? <laughs> no, not really. No. Some people are. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing that I like have to do or have to eat or drink, for example. I probably am a creature of habit. But okay. But there isn't anything that if I don't have. I know some people have the same safety pins they use for the race number. Yeah, Andy. That I'd oh. be useless because I just lose them yeah. straight away. So Yeah, same. I would lose it's them. It's a good job I'm not superstitious. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd have nothing. Yeah. Um, do you find now that you've been doing this for so long that it comes naturally or do you still have days where you're like, absolutely not, this is awful? Oh, there's definitely days where you're not motivated to train. It, it makes me laugh when people talk about, you know, how do you stay motivated? Because my straight answer is, I don't. Like you <laughs> cannot be motivated every day. Yeah. So the hard part, I suppose, is about showing up and getting it done when you don't want to do mm. it. And I think the best thing you can do in those scenarios is like trick yourself into having to do it by like planning to meet with someone or meeting for a specific route. And I've got teammates that I train with anyway, so I'm really lucky in that sense. But yeah, it's just about kind of getting out, getting your head down. And I think you never regret it afterwards because no. you know that like it's about being consistent. That That is all runners though, isn't it? That, is, yeah. that goes for all runners. It's like no matter what level you're at, 
when, how you feel afterwards, you, you just go, thank God I did that. Yeah. But beforehand, yeah. it's so hard, especially yeah. when it's miserable. Yeah. And I, it, I think that... it's harder when you've got to fit more stuff in as well. Yeah. So people are working and they've got to leave for the train at eight o'clock. It's so much harder to get out at 6 a.m. when it's dark in the winter for a run when, you know, like what's going to motivate you at that time of day? Yeah. yeah. I always find, I find as well that it's incredible with running in that you can lose your motivation so quickly. Mm -hmm. Like I literally had... I did a 5k block and then had a week off, one week off. Yeah. And then suddenly my alarm that on a Monday, I can usually set a 6.30 alarm, run five miles and then make it to work on time. And it took me four weeks of that alarm going off and going like, oh no. <laughs> really? <laughs> no. Four yeah. weeks? And today is the first day that I managed to well do Well done, Sarah. Wow. Did I feel yes. better after? Yes, yes I did. Yes, you did. <laughs> did I, for the last four weeks, go... Bed is better. <laughs> yes, I did. Um, you are listening to the Running Channel podcast. Up next, we've got your questions to answer. But first, we've each picked a new story from the world of running to discuss. Okay, so we've got your questions coming up and we've got some absolute corkers mm. today, I can assure you. Uh, first, though, let's get into our, our running story of the week. Philly, do you want to kick off? Yeah, so I've picked um, quite a big one in the elite running world. And it has it has made some papers as well in the sort of general um, media. And that's that we are taking a much smaller team to the world championships this year. Um, we spoke about the world ranking system earlier on. And it's because 19 athletes or at a minimum 19 athletes who are basically being invited because they've achieved qualification through that ranking system won't be going to the champs. So it's a policy that was announced 10 months ago but it's kind of being sort of experienced now by the athletes that are outraged that they're not going okay it's affecting them so. so they literally have got an invitation they've qualified yeah so for example um lena nielsen is one of them she's our second best 400 hurdler ranked yeah second in the uk and she's ranked 27th in the world so there'll be about 40 athletes in the hurdles five heats and British Athletics will be rejecting her invitation because she's missed the qualifying standard, which is the only route that they're using to take people. And okay. she's missed that standard by six hundredths of a second. Oh my gosh. Which so is she's like been invited. Whip. She's been invited to come, but she can't go. Yeah, so she's qualified by World Athletics, uh, you know, standard. And UK have decided no, uh, along with 18 others. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <sighs> we're I going. Yeah, yeah, we <laughs> we got in. Yeah, I kind of want to give her. I mean, oh, we're not racing, our, but I kind no, of want to give, give her, her our plane. Give her our ticket. place on the plane. Yeah, yeah. I'm that sure is... she wouldn't want to be there to watch. After no, no that. that is heartbreaking. Yeah, especially if you're you're going to watch 40 people and you're 27th in the world. And yeah, you're so not there, there probably won't be 40 there by that sort of basis because I don't think they'll then you know if the 27th ranked athlete their invitation isn't accepted by their federation. They're not going to then offer downwards. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's affecting a, a guy that came fifth in the hurdles at, at the championships last year, the world champs. He finished fifth in the 110 hurdles and his invite's being rejected this year. So it, it's, it's mind blowing. But does that also suggest that we've got some really quality athletes going and that the standard is that high? The standard is that high and we do have a really good team. Like those 51 athletes, they're fantastic. Um, the The basis that they've selected those people on is that they want to prioritise um, medals and top eight placings. Mm -hmm. This is UKA. But my kind of thinking is if you take the other 19 as well, because mm. they've been invited, like they've qualified to go, surely the chances of top eight placings and medals is more just because you've got more athletes that yeah. are there vying for those top spots. It's also, I always think of it in terms of if you're watching at home yeah, and you're not seeing your country's your representatives. Country, yeah, yeah, that's going to have an effect. That's going to affect top eight placings in mm. 20 years time because yeah. you're tuning into something and being like, oh, well, the UK is not very good at that. Yeah. And it's like, no, we're 600 of a second <laughs> away from like being incredible at that. We just weren't allowed to go. Yeah, I do wonder how many youngsters will, will sort of be affected by, you know, not being as inspired by seeing someone in their event. Like there's hardly any field eventers going. I think we've mm. got one male field eventer across all of the field events going. Um, and it also affects athletes' livelihoods later down the line because mm. making teams is a massive part of an elite athlete's contract. So if they then don't make the team because 
their home country's federation have said yeah. you're not good enough for us, then it might actually affect their ability to right. do that professionally yeah, later down the line. No, it's gutting. And they do an amazing spa in Budapest as well. So all those people are going to miss out on a quality <laughs> weekend away. Yeah. Yeah. I think they might have been doing other things. True. Sarah, what you got? <laughs> so crazy. I've got something very different. Um, so... Uh, this weekend, yeah. or last weekend, it was the Battersea Park Half Marathon and a new course record was set by Paul Sellian. Uh, sorry if I've said that wrong. And he ran it in one hour, five minutes and 18 seconds, wow. which is incredible. But one thing that I found amazing is that he set a course record and the photo, we'll try and put this on screen if we've got it. The photo, he was going so fast that the press photo is of the person behind him. <laughs> he was perfectly in focus. So I just found that amazing. And was that the second place finisher or was that someone he was laughing? No, I think it was someone he was amazing. laughing. It may have been the second place finisher, I don't know, but I just thought it was so incredible incredible of how like mostly with races you you expect this kind of beautiful photography to come out and this time the guy behind him is pulling an incredible, incredible facial expression distance. yeah he was definitely being lapped <laughs> i love that yeah yeah, yeah. And absolutely that's a lot of laps as well around battersea park yeah yeah i did the so it was two laps i did a 5k there i don't know if they changed the course slightly oh, but that is anything worse than, yeah do you must be a lot of laps for a half it's flat it is quite flat it is flat it's also dubious gps wise oh there. the trees Ooh. around there yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially like the more runners you get in one space in that area. Anyone that tells me that they've got a 5k PB on their watch around Battersea Park. Oh, really? Raise his eyebrows. <laughs> See, yeah. is, is, what, so what are your, that's really interesting. So what are your thoughts on when you wait for your watch to start on your GPS and if it can't find you, but then they say go? Mm, you Does, go. Is it still accurate? Uh, probably not, no. No. Because it's then trying to find you whilst you're moving and you'll probably see that the map that it registers when you check the app or Strava is like not where you ran. Oh. Um, but yeah, I have lots of interesting conversations with athletes that say like, oh, well, th the results say I got this time, but my 10K on my watch was this. And I'm like, no, 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 no. 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 You've no, got it. No, 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 got no, no, no. Results are everything. <laughs> it's actually yeah. the old school that still works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Well, yeah, just because you to point... out, measure the course <laughs> properly. <laughs> With um, marathons, do you ever find courses where you're just like, oh, I could never run that one again. It was too windy. Uh, well, I've only done two. So I feel like the kind of reflection on it is, is limited, mm -hmm. but they've been flat so far. So no, it would only be hills. <laughs> <laughs> not don't fancy a trail marathon anytime soon then. No. no. <laughs> no fast and flat. What about um cob have you done anywhere they've had like cobbles as part yes. of the I, I thought you were gonna say cobbles. Then. Cobbles. cobbles. No, I just find it right. I find this so fascinating. I was talking to another athlete who ran, I think, Valencia marathon mm. and she was going for like a really fast time, but had so many cobbles or maybe it was Seville and she was like had yeah. such a big I was about to say because I did Seville and there was some cobbles <laughs> and yeah. it's all a bit tricky there's also a bit where they make you run up to and around this fountain like you literally come into this square almost turn right turn run around this circular fountain and you're just there like what is the point in this part <laughs> of the course because you can see where you're going next but you come on to the cobbles to do that bit and it's at about 35k so you're Patience oh, is about yeah. here. And also, like, the shoes are amazing, but the the more the shoe is doing for you, the less you want to be, like, turning because you're, like, yeah. building up the speed in it as yeah, well. Yeah, and the super shoes these days, they're not great for kind of tight Balance. corners. Yeah. yeah. Especially later on in the race when your body's also not good for tight <laughs> corners. <Yeah. laughs> 35K and you just need to see the finish line. Yeah. It just goes just straight. straight. Although that would be torturous as well. Yeah, five k straight for the finish of a marathon. Just seeing the finish, sort of. That's what um, Brighton is. You like oh. turn the corner. I think it's seven miles. You can see the finish line for. Oh, I'm definitely oh not God. doing that one. Really, <laughs> seven <laughs> miles. Another... Yeah, I mean, great if you want to know how much you've got. You've there. Got to go. Yeah, got to go. And now it's time for your questions. Okay, so it's time for your questions. And don't forget, if you would like to ask us something, you can email podcast at the .com. First up today, Stan from Devon. Stan, thanks for telling us where you're from. Really kind. This is quite a long question, so bear with me, you two. <laughs> Will training almost entirely over hills disadvantage me in my flat marathon in October in Abingdon? I'm looking for advice as I've just got into a marathon training block and it's all heart rate zone based and locally I'm surrounded by hills and even put a little map in for us. It means, for example, my easy zone two can slow to a walk um 
can slow to a walk up most hills despite my relative fitness level. Now, this is an intriguing question because if you are training a certain way, the topography of where you live Good clearly word. flips things up, Philly. Mm. And I imagine that's changed for you recently because you moved house. Yeah, so I'm also dealing with not quite as severe by the sound of it. I can I can avoid the hills by going on the canals or the mm. Midwood Way where I am. But um, yeah, I feel Stan's pain in this one. It's um, it's hard to, especially if you're training by heart rate, to keep it down mm. when you're running up a literal mountain. Is there a way around this? I would say don't worry about slowing down and walking on the really steep ups because you'll still get strength from that in the sort of heart rate training effect. But I notice he said that he uses a sort of flat or relatively flat housing estate for sort of intervals and the specific sessions, which is bang on. That's what I would say to do because then you're comparing relative pace that you'll be doing on the flat marathon mm. on flat ground. You'll still get really fit if you were to do those sessions, pace adjusted or heart rate adjusted on the hills. But mentally it's, it's, Good that you've got the flat to work on that you're going to then race on as well yeah it's nice to have a mixture yeah. and actually i think this is a better way around if you if he was emailing in and saying i live in a totally flat area mm. and i've got oh, a yeah. really hilly marathon coming up i'd be like Ooh. that's tricky <laughs> oh yeah. that's gonna be hard i actually saw someone who was preparing for um utmb mm. doing a session at a like ridiculous treadmill incline using poles and i think they had a an altitude mask on as well like uh, preparing oh. for it. Imagine doing that. What? Yeah. Just, <laughs> what? Ru just running around North London? No, no, no. They were on a treadmill. Oh, right, on a treadmill? Yeah. Oh, wow. I can't remember the name of the athlete, but it's someone who's. It was Elsie Davis, was it? Potentially, I yeah. I saw her with a mask on in her garage on a treadmill. That's yes. so cute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nuts. Yeah, yeah, she was preparing for UTMB, so she got her poles out on a treadmill with an incline. Wow. So, yeah, don't worry, really Stan. You've got the hills for you. You don't need to do that. But I would say, yeah, keep doing what you're doing and. Abingdon will feel like a lovely break. From and the he's hills. asked whether he's he's concerned he might miss out on the top end speed. I think use the hills for that. If you if you yeah. can add in some hill sprints, they're brilliant for adding in some speed. Although you might not be going as fast, it stimulates the same training effect. Mm. And if you've got that housing estate to go around on your intervals, you'll probably notice how people that live on that housing estate must be sort of peeking through their windows, <laughs> seeing, seeing, seeing the same guy running around. Yeah, oh, yeah. There he is again. It's Tuesday. Stands here. Like, Where's how... he going? <laughs> and why is he going so fast? <laughs> how, how much is there in actually driving somewhere? I know it's kind of like you know against. The, the rules a little bit, but mm. going somewhere else to train so it reflects better the conditions you're going to have on race day. Yeah, I think if you need that kind of practice, it's good to do it if it's for a couple of key sessions in the block. Mm. I wouldn't get into the routine of doing that every week, especially if it's a long drive. Like mm. running is meant to be good for the environment and that you can just do it from your front door. So if you can find somewhere that's like a two, three mile warm up to then a nice flat route, okay. that's ideal. So we've also got Anna from York this week, and she says that she's got her first 10K race coming up. Um, it's the York 10K. Best of luck. Do you have any tips on how to keep negative self-talk away? She says she loves the grind, but is struggling with that. Oh, it's a tricky one because when you're in pain or in, mm. the, in the hardest parts of a race, our, our brains are wide in a way to get you out of that pain. So it will throw that negative voice yes. at you to say, stop, I don't like this, you can't do this. What are you doing? You can't do this, stop. So you almost have to try and reverse that. And it's a really natural thing to do to you know, let those negative thoughts run over. And it might feel silly, but I'd suggest writing down what you want to hear from your internal monologue mm. and say it out loud. Spend 10 minutes a day, maybe before your session, Doing it in the mirror, it can feel really, really silly and maybe make sure there's no one around because it can make you self-conscious sometimes. Yeah. But say those things out loud and it can start to trickle through to then that's what you go to in a race or in a session. And if you can force that, great. Even if you don't believe it, saying like, I'm fit, I'm fast, I can do this, it will trickle down. Are um, you going to tell us what your mantra is? So that's one of them. I use I'm fit, I'm fast, I'm in control those three statements. Okay. Um, I mean, love the grind is something that I say on my channel and I, I use that sometimes in training, but it's more of a, I love the process in all of its good and bad sides. Mm. And another one I used in the marathon was relax, rhythm, flow. 
the shorter the better because it's simple and it's easy to go to and words that resonate with you so don't try and copy someone else's if, if there's a specific word or phrase that works for you great go with that sarah what's yours again mine is run the mile you're in is always what i come Strong. back to oh, I yeah. but i uh, this is something i'm really trying to yeah. work on because i keep i up until the point where i race i'm struggling with 5k's at the moment up until the point that i start running i'm like i really want this i really want this pb i've worked hard for it and then as soon as I tick over into that halfway point and it starts to get hard, I'm like, oh, I just don't, I don't want it. And then, and then <laughs> the not negative, today, next not today, week, you know? no, but then the negative self-talk turns into like, but why do you want this? And, mm -hmm. I, and I don't think I've quite found that enough yet to then push through and get past it. But I had a 5k race a couple of weeks ago where just halfway through, I was like, you don't want this. And I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> it crept in. It crept, <laughs> it crept in. in. It crept and I was in. like, walk the rest of it. Yeah. I just slowed right down. But then there was also like, it was a two lap, it was a batty two lap course. And I saw people at the halfway point and I was like, oh God, I didn't know they were going to be here. <laughs> now I really need to do it. And then I spent that whole second lap going, no you don't you don't you don't really want it do you and i was like oh but they're there but don't d uh, and then and then oh. it all, not helpful is it it all went wrong yeah it all went wrong and then you just have some people who just whose mantras just contrast so is that what yours is yeah the what does that mean rick the faster you run the quicker you'll finish rick slow and steady wins the race <laughs> <laughs> oh, i see what you mean i, I, use, thought I use both Every week. I thought your mantra was literally just contrast, contrast, contrast. <laughs> <laughs> As you were running I'm along. picturing you with two mini ricks. One <laughs> saying slow down, the other one like arguing exactly. with that one. Exactly. Maybe I should run Brighton so that's, I can see the finish. Yeah, that's a yeah, nice yeah. distraction of you just it arguing is. with yourself. Yeah. Well, amazing. Philly, thank you so much for joining us. Thank Hope you, you for having it. me. It's been a blast. Nice. Um, you've been listening to The Running Channel Podcast. Do make sure to email in podcast at therunningchannel.com if you've got any other guests you'd like us to have on when me and Rick Ooh, that's head a good off idea. on holiday. We Who should have a guest every week and know Andy. <laughs> oh, yeah. All that. Or it's like, um, pick your character. Oh, Who that, would you want to play you in the movie? Oh, when this we're is very away? good. This is very good. Who Andy, would, we miss you. Yeah, Andy, yeah. hope you're having a good holiday. <laughs> yeah. He will be back next week. Um, please make sure to rate and review as well. We love reading your reviews and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.